sorry, join up. I was gonna have you do it anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So yeah, we're gonna be doing authentication with React Context. So we've, we've already used React Context. This is like our data provider component that we've written. So we're gonna use um, that for the front end. Um, and, you know, there's other tools with authentic, like not just authentication, but more with like this shared state. Um, we could use Redux. There's like auth um, Redux, definitely solutions out there. Um, we will talk about Redux in this course. I think it's a, it's definitely like my go-to for state management, but um, React Context, I think gives us a simpler way to do it. Um, and then once we get familiar with React Context, Redux is gonna be easier to learn. Cool. So yeah, um, we're going to use a third party library for as far as the Rails backend. So this is gonna be called device token auth. And we can load that up. Now Rails has something like there's this third party library called Devise. If we were just doing like a, just a Rails app with no React doing a full MVC Rails app and we wanted to do authentication, this would probably be the gem you would choose to use. And it's it's a really nice gem. It, it's, it's pretty easy to use it. It's like all of our like writ, like auth stuff set up. So, and there's really not that much work we do. And it also has like all this other functionality. So it's not just authentication. We can do database authentication. So th that, that's, what, that's what we're talking about. Like store, it's like keeping track of the password and email to log in the user. We can do OmniAuth. Has anyone heard of like OmniAuth? Does anyone know what that is? I mean, you, you do, you just might not know the name. This is like when you like log in, you can go to a website and like log in with like your Facebook account or log in with Google. So you don't need to like sign in with an email and password. Oh, so, okay. So it's like the, you're signing in with a different. Yeah, you're, you're signing in with a different provider you're already signed in with. So okay. this, this is like super nice, you know, when you go to like, like a new website like Lucidchart and you can just log in with GitHub. Okay, that makes sense. Um, then you don't have to like, it's nice because then you don't have to like remember a new password because it's just using the one, the stuff from another website. Um, there's like this confirmable feature where this sends an email confirmation instructions and verifies, you know, whether that, you know, account is signed in or like if there's already that email taken. So, and then you can verify that that person's email is the email they say it is. So, you know, people can't just randomly try to log into your site with an invalid email. Um, recoverable. So this is like the functionality to uh, reset a password. You, you forget your password, you can hit the like forget password button. Um, Registerable, this is just, you're able to sign up. This is like, so there's kind of those two steps we do is like you register to a website. That's like you, you first create an account. And then once you have that created, then you can log in and log out. Um, there's like rememberable. So this is just a way to kind of remember stuff about you know, the user who's logged in, you can kind of save information in what's either like a cookie or a token. There's trackable. This is like, you can kind of like count how many times they've signed in, like timestamps, IP addresses, just we can track them. You can kind of watch, like see what they're doing. Time outable, this is, you know, if you've ever been on a bank, banking website, um, and like it automatically logs you out after like five minutes of inactivity. 
um, lockable. You can like, you know, someone tries to log in a certain amount of times, you can not allow them to do it. Cool. So <clears throat> this is the Vise. This is kind of the Rails solution. If you're just using a Rails app, but we're not using a Rails app. We, and, and it's kind of like behind the scenes, this is just purely like session-based authentication, which session and cookie-based authentication, which we're not gonna go into too much detail right now what that is. Um, but really this is like, if we had one app that was like self-contained, but that's not how we do it. We have like a back-end app and then we could have like many front-end apps using it. So we're gonna use a version of this called device token auth. So this is really um, built, like it's saying right here, this project leverages the following gems. Like it's using like some device stuff, it's using on the auth, but it, it's a little, it's, it's kind of its own version of it. And this, what this does is this gonna give us token-based authentication for our Rails app. So, and here's, here it's saying, you know, if you're building a single page application or mobile app and you want authentication, you need tokens, not cookies. So that's what this is gonna do. It's gonna give us this token style based authentication, not cookies. We can't use cookies if we're having like two separate apps. You can only use cookies if it's like you're doing all the stuff on a Rails app, which we haven't even done. So, but it is good to note, um, we're using this gem device token auth, but it's kind of built on device. So if you run into issues, sometimes you find yourself looking at device tutorials and like device helpers and seeing if you can like, you know, figure out how to make it work. Cool. So yeah, let's just jump in. So we're gonna be creating an app called Cat Tinder. We're gonna do a little Tinder app, but it's gonna be, we're gonna like and dislike cats. So you could think about something, I mean like most apps, um, but like something like Tinder or Cat Tinder in our case, like where you're gonna to wanna to have someone like log in to the website before they start selecting, you know, cats that they like. Because different people are gonna like different cats. You might share the same list of cats. Like we might have 10 caps, cats in our database, but then we're gonna also have users and, you know, maybe users, different users are gonna like different cats. So we're gonna to need to like log into our database, log into our website to see like the cats that um, the user likes or that logged in user likes. So let's go ahead and just get this started. So we're gonna start from scratch here, creating a new Rails app. Let's go ahead and open up iTerm. So it's kind of maybe been a while since we've um, and I'm gonna, let me just get this organized so I can easily sack this stuff out. One second. Okay. So I'm, just, so I'm gonna slack a lot of this code out. So here's just us getting set up with just our basic backend. So yeah, we want to do um, a Rails app. So Rails new, call this cat Tinder, spring 22. And this is gonna be a Postgres database. And we'll make it an API.
So we're just going to start out this with doing just the back end stuff. Okay. Now I can see into cat Tinder. I'm going to go ahead and create my database. I am also So I don't know, as you're going through this, let's open this up in code. As you're maybe going through this homework and this starter project, I think this can maybe be a good opportunity to, you know, either create like a flow chart like um, Drea had, or you go create your readme. This can be a good time to really document these steps of like, you know, and you can do these as detailed as you want. Like this creates a new Rails project. That Tinder using Postgres database. So you be as like detailed as you want with these. Like maybe you don't need to like say what this is doing or this is doing because you know by now. So it's kind of like you go through and like if there's if there's a spot that confuses you, like go ahead and document it. And you can you can even make make it like generic like project name. So this this can really be like I said, I'm gonna just stress this. This can be an opportunity for you to really go through like these, this, these next two days and this weekend to just go through and like document everything, get more clear on, you know, some of the stuff we've been doing for a lot of the course, but maybe it's a little blurry. Go through and create some documentation. Like do the, the rubber ducky method to explain it to yourself. Um, which part of the project name says it's a reacting? Is it the API part that makes it like you like not doing part of the rail like if you were only doing rails it would be not have that part the api yeah so this that that could be something you didn't that yeah you go and like like what does this do and then like you could go research that but yeah the dash dash api that um you know is going to make rails you know only act as an API, meaning, and, and we haven't really talked about this, like Rails is not going to um, have any views. Like, you know, Rails by default is a MVC framework. You know, it's the model view, view controller. You know, doing the API, you know, really makes our app in like MV framework. And you know, eventually, you know, we, we use React. So if you were doing any Rails project and you didn't want to use Rails, you just do the dash dash API, but then you can do anything. It doesn't just have to be React. Or does that make it, what part makes it React? No, nothing here makes this React. You could just, cause so you could use any other thing. Yeah, we could use uh, Angular. We could just use, I mean, it doesn't have to be, it could be a mobile app. What we're doing and like our API, really what our API is, 
as far as like a Rails server, you can think of that as like when you do the Rails info routes. That's what we're defined. That's like our API. It's like, hey, if you do a get request to users, I'm going to get you back all the users. That's like my API. If you do a post request to users and give me some user data, I'll create a user. It's like, I don't care, like as the back, as the Rails app, I don't care if you're using React or Angular or a mobile app or Postman. I, I'm just an API. You give me the, the HTTP request and the URL and I'll, I'll do it as long as I have those routes defined and those actions in my controllers set up. So, right, yeah, this is like, back end so yeah another way you could say this is like dash api makes rails like it's back end only There's, rails is doing nothing with the front end we just render get HTTP requests. Generally respond with JSON. We'll say respond with JSON. You can think of just like the data. Yeah, these, these are the good things to go through and like get clarifications on. If there's something that's like a little confusing, then yeah, ask me or my, like the TA or like Google it. So this starts to, you know, sink in. All right. So the next thing that we could do is, um, you know, add some gems. You know, gems are going to be like, you know, third party, um, third party libraries that do stuff for us. We have used, you know, something like, you know, some examples would be Faker that like allows us to, you know, create fake data, create fake. But you know, real world, like real looking data. I don't know what to call that, realistic looking data. We have used, you know, pry rails that you know can help us debug. We're gonna add today, we're going to add device token auth. That's gonna, you know with auth on the back end. And you know, there can be lots more. Whatever you need. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's go. And then this is where like, once again, you can maybe like have a step like, you know, to add a gem, add it to your gem file. Then what, does anyone remember what I need to do after I add something to my gem file? Bundle. Yeah. And run bundle to install gem. All right, so let's go to our gem file. Let's go ahead and add. So what we want to do, so we're gonna add gem. Advise token off. Do gem. Try. 
So I'm going to say this at this level, because like, why am I adding the pry rails here and the device token auth here? So at this level, this gem will be in all environments. So it's going to be production, testing, and development. I'm going to want authentication in all of these environments. You know, if I do it here and you can kind of see now maybe like development tests, what do you think this is going to be visible at? This gem is going to be visible at um, test and development. I don't need, I don't want prior rails in production. It's like a debugging tool. So with something like Faker, I don't know, maybe, do I want to use Faker in my production database? Maybe, maybe not. It depends for now. I mean, really it doesn't matter now because we're only doing development like that's the only environment we're working with, but definitely like your device token off you'd want to throw here because if you were ever to push this to production, you would definitely want this there or else it wouldn't work. Does that make sense? We haven't done a production environment, we will, but Um, let's see here. Let's keep going. So we can go ahead and run our bundle. Device token auth. Did I not spell that right? Oh, is it under? Oh, it's underscore. Device token. All right. Oh, we have a new version of Rails. Okay. see it yeah so rails just recently updated like um like oh, like six like right before this cohort started to rails version seven so let's just talk about this since we're seeing this um if we look through these numbers, like, or through our gem file, we can see like these numbers, like 3.0.2, 7.0.2, 1 1.1, 5.0. Um, so yeah, generally when we talk about versioning, this is a way we can kind of keep track of like which version of a project, like a project we're on since we're getting also more into like third party libraries. Because this can be one of the headaches with third party libraries is like this versioning. So let's, let's think like I'm writing like something like, you know, Rails. Rails has been around for a long time, like, I don't know, a decade at least. And, you know, it's been, we've been wanting to like upgrade Rails, right? It's been, it's not like Rails was developed 10 years ago and it's just been the, the same. It's being actively worked on. It's being actively changed. It's being fixed. So, and new features are being added. Like there's stuff you can do in Rails 7 that you can't do in Rails 4. So when we talk about versioning, 
there's kind of a general syntax or a general convention to like these numbers. They're not just randomly 3.0.2, like there's kind of a general convention behind them. So what you generally have is you have um, a major change dot minor change dot patch. So like six dot z seven dot three. So let's say I let's say we have um, you know some app like whatever. This is my app, my app, or my third party lib, and it's this version, and that's the version I'm using. But you know, I'm using this at a given date. But this my third party app is being updated. So they go, they find a bug, or they find a couple bugs, they make some changes, and they push that up to GitHub. And or they push it to whatever they're using. They've made changes to their code, to their product, and they, you know, now they have a new version of it. Well, if it's just like bug fixes it's going to update the patch. So say this patch is going to be minor, um, like uh, this is really just going to be like bug fixes. So if you see a bump in like, if you're using 6.7.3 and like you see there's a new version like 6.7.4, and you're wondering, hey, can I upgrade to 6.7.4? You know, it's gonna be safe to upgrade. Because it's just gonna get bug fixes. So we have a minor version. So let's say I go into this, my like the developers go into my third party app and they make some, some small improvements. They add like maybe some new features or they even fix some bugs, whatever. They might bump up the minor version to like from 6.7 to 6.8. So a minor change would be like, you know, potentially new features added. But um, no breaking changes. Meaning, you know, it should be safe to upgrade. So let's say the my third party app they they go through and they do like a man like a whole new version. Like they go through, they do a whole bunch of features. They kind of change how it works. They had a whole bunch of new stuff, but to do so, they kind of have to like rewrite some of their code. And they have to kind of change some of their functionality to get this new and better code working. So then they're going to bump up this to like seven and then they would like reset that to like zero and zero. And that would be like a major upgrade or a major update. So that is new features. These are generally like small improvements. We could do a major, that's going to be new features. These are going to be big improvements. And these could potentially break code. So um, yeah, like just to give you an example, just like this, this happens all the time. It's like, you know, my last job with our React Native app, I, I don't remember the version. It was like, whatever, like we were using like version 55, about whatever. 
and there was like a new version of like i mean the newest one was like 63 but version i'm making these numbers up like 58 had hooks but we were on 55 So you might just ask, well, why didn't you just update the 58 so you could use hooks? Well, when you update, when you go from like a, when you have like an app that's like built out and there's a lot of third-party libraries depending on it, or like you have it set up a certain way, it can sometimes be the case that like upgrading a library, especially something like, Re like the main one, like React Native, you know, is going to break stuff. So we, you know, kept on 55 and like, you know, to do, we had a big to do of like upgrading to, you know, latest version of React. Or we at least wanted to get to like 58. We weren't even trying to get to like the newest. We we're just trying to get to 58. But that was like a lot of work. So we just never, they never got around to it by the time I left. Is it that much work? It can be. So you just have to update it? Okay, so let's say, um, well, let's, let's do a little example. Um, Like one of them, I mean, like something like hooks, that's that's like a pretty big feature or like stuff like that. Um, something that recently happened was, you know, React Router updated, which was kind of a pain because like some of their stuff changed. Like if you use like React, So I, I, yeah, I think this is like a good question. Like, shouldn't it, that's like, was mine. Don't you just update it? Let's look at React Router, like version five. You know, you come in here, you do routes. Now I'm not gonna be able to do this off the top of my head, but it, it was something like this. You'd have a route and you have like this exact path equals, you know, whatever users or whatever, and then it was like component. And then that would be, you know, you just throw in some like component name right here, like users. Okay, but in React version six, you know, this is now elements. You don't use this exact anymore. You know, with React router six, you can also like nest routes. Like there's just some new feature, like there's just some stuff you can do with version six that you can't do with version five. And do like these weird nested routes. There was a different way to do nested routes in React version, you know, uh, one or version five. But let's let's just like keep it simple for now, just so you could see. So I'm using React version five. Let's say I upgrade to version six. Well, this is how, like my code's not gonna magically update to this. This is how my code's going to look. And now this is how React version six is gonna want it. So my code's going to break. Cause it doesn't want like this component prop. It wants a element prop. And it actually wants it as like a actual. So then you'd have to go in and like change all your code. Yeah. <clears throat> I see. 
And where it really gets messy is when you like, when you're updating something like Rails or React and you have a lot of third-party libraries, those third-party libraries were like written, tested with like React being a certain version. So right when Rails comes out with like a new version, there's gonna be all these third parties that, you know, they need time to get their third party app working with the ver Rails version seven. So like they need time to go in and make their code compatible with like that new version. And so sometimes when you're using like a, a library, like especially when it's something like Rails or um, you know, React, if they upgrade, there's a lot of the libraries are not just automatically going to be compatible with them. So yeah, it can, it's, it's not just as simple as just upgrading the number because you upgrade the number and that can break stuff. So yeah, this potentially breaks code. So it's going to be very unlikely you go to a company and they're using Rails 7. They're probably using 6. They might be using 5. You know, <clears throat> uh, 6 has been out for a couple of years, so they're probably on 6. So I'm just hoping there's not an issue with this where device token auth is. It's also using an alpha version. Have you heard these terms, alpha and beta? Let's look at those terms too. Does anyone know what like an alpha? That's just like beta and alpha testing, right? Yeah. This is like um, really, so this is like, so when we're talking about versioning before, maybe we go from like 58 to 50, like, you know, so let's say this, let's say like this one, before we, or like a library goes from library or whatever product. These are, these are, these are good terms to know because you'll, 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 you'll see them and you'll hear them. So before a library or product goes from like one version to another, and it's generally gonna be like your major version. Like before we go from like React, you know, 16 to React 17. We'll have what's called like alpha release. And you've seen these, like you might like, maybe when you're like downloading node or you're downloading some product and say, hey, do you want to use like this version 18? That's like alpha version. This is going to be, you know, the new features, but this is also going to be like untested. Or like, I don't say untested. Let's just say this is going to be, you know. Not widely tested? Yeah, it's going to be buggy. Yeah, not, not widely tested. It's almost like, it's like a pre, these are like pre-release versions. And alpha is like the, but like, you know, hey, I want to experiment. <laughs> New features. It's like, it gives you the ability to like go in and experiment, but it's gonna be very buggy. Alphas in particular. Then you have betas, beta release. These are also, you know, these are gonna have like the new features. These are gonna be like more tested, less buggy, but not stable. So once it's like, it's like a step up from alpha. It's like, okay, this is a little more tested. We're in the beta mode. 
then you might have another level of like a RC for like a release candidate. And this can be something like, ooh, we are close. This might be the one. Like, it's a candidate for the, the product to be released. And then they might have a couple release candidates or like they might come out with one and it's kind of like final level of this pre-testing. And then after that, then, you know, it's then you'd actually release the version. And, you know, you can see this with like, I mean, this is like, I mean, you definitely like things like Apple and Google, they do stuff like this, like, oh, you want to get the new Mac OS, you want to get the alpha version, it's like, yeah, do that if you're a developer and you know what you're doing. Like you would, like Apple would never be like to its general population, hey, download the new alpha Mac OS or the beta or the RC, but they'll have them available for people who want to do it. Maybe you're a developer and you like want to stay on like the fringe. You want to be ready when Apple does come out with that new release you can go start, you can go download their release and put up with the bugs and you can start working on it. So yeah, there's a little side note into versioning. This is like a, you know, this is a big part of like the product life cycle. It's one, you know, software is always changing. It's always being fixed. It's always being updated. Um, and so there's kind of like this general, I mean, obviously different products are going to have like their own little flavor of this, but there's kind of like this idea of, you know, going from one version to another. And now I'm scared because this is a new version of Rails and maybe... Um, we'll see if we can get device token off. I know Henry just did this yesterday. I don't think he... So let's go ahead. I'm going to run this bundle update. Let's see if, okay. Could not find compatible version device token auth was resolved to. That doesn't sound right. This is saying like, it's relying on version four. Okay, so let's do this. I'm gonna to go to their documentation. Go to their docs. They have Jim Merchant. Let's see here. Let's okay. So they do have like th their GitHub's not um their README. They have their own website. I'm just trying to find their link for their website. How come I can't find it? Docs. It's right there. <clears throat> Let's see here. Installation. Maybe not. Man, I almost wonder if it's okay. Um, 
I might have us take an early break kind of as I look through this so you don't have to like watch me do this. It's not a bad time for a break anyway since it's 1030. Um, let's go ahead. Let's take a break. Let's come back at 1045 and hopefully I have a workaround by then. Sounds good. 